a hiker found human remains belonging to a male near Natural Bridges State Park in Santa Cruz County at 4.30 a.m. on October 6, 1982. Investigators determined that the unknown man's life had been taken by someone. For 41 years, the case remained cold until an important partnership with emerging forensic-grade genome sequencing was done by Othram Labs. Othram is the first private laboratory in North America that was purpose-built to generate human ID from forensic evidence and crime scene evidence. They are working cases like this one all across North America and having a great deal of success. DNA extract that was derived from the victim's bones were sent to Othram from the California Department of Justice. Othram did what is called a suitability analysis on it and measured how much DNA is truly there. Othram Labs has the capability to look at hundreds of thousands of DNA markers, making it easier to find more distant relatives and reverse engineer back to the direct family. In this case, it was genealogy that pointed towards a family of the victim. The FBI then got involved and they were able to use some fingerprinting once they had an idea of who it may be to confirm that identity. Law enforcement was able to take that important link and finally give a name to the body known for so long to investigators as John Doe. In October 2023, it was announced to the public that the human remains belonged to 28-year-old Rodney Allen Rumsey. Rodney was born on May 25, 1954. He lived in Sacramento, California. Michael Vogan, the director of account management at Othram Labs, said, This started out as an unidentified human remains case, and now... They have an entirely new case that they are investigating. The community is impacted. The detectives are impacted. Decades of family members, and it feels really good. And we celebrate it, and then it is on to the next one. Rodney's left forearm had a red rose with three leaves on it and a tattoo of a skull on his left forearm. The skull had black braids, three red-tipped feathers jutting out from the head and red around the eye sockets. Lieutenant Karina Sassinia, a spokeswoman for the Santa Cruz Police Department, said investigators still have much work to do and will try to reach out to Rumsey's family. Anyone with information about this case may call the Santa Cruz Police Department's investigation unit at 831-420-5820 or the department's tip line at 831-420-5995. In February 2021, human remains were discovered by chance by workmen in a sealed well near an abandoned warehouse in Oporino, south of Vigo and near the border with Portugal. The remains had become badly decomposed and undergone a process known as saponification, in which bacteria thriving in a wet and warm environment turn body fat into a waxy soap-like substance, leaving the body completely unrecognizable. Investigators were able to conclude that the unknown man had received a fatal blow to the head and other heavy impacts to the body but the lack of flesh and absence of any personal effects in the well meant his identity was a mystery. DNA tests did not produce a match with any known individual or missing person in police databases. With the investigation at a standstill in 2022, the Guardia Civil Police Force turned to Fernando Cerula, a forensic scientist from Galicia's Institute of Legal Medicine. Forensic facial reconstruction involves the reconstruction of a face based on skeletal remains, combining anatomic science with anthropology and a degree of artistic interpretation. With the help of artist Alba Sanin, 
Dr. Sarula came up with six versions of the man's face, each with slight variations in hair color and differing amounts of facial hair. The photo fit style impressions worked. Within weeks, a woman from Portugal came forward to say she recognized her brother, who she had not seen for more than three years. DNA testing confirmed the woman's story and the unknown man was identified as Carlos Alberto Vidiera do Orfeo, originally from Viana do Castillo in Portugal, but who had been living in Spain for 20 years and had been running a used car business in Vigo. Guardia civil investigators were able to pinpoint the time of the 37-year-old Carlos's disappearance as October 13th, 2018. Tracing his movements leading up to his demise, the investigators identified five suspects believed to have differing degrees of involvement in a slaying they say could be related to swindles perpetrated by Carlos in his dealings with used cars. Two of the men accused have been remanded in custody by the investigating judge in Oporino, while the third man believed to have participated has been released on bail. Dr. Cerula has developed a reputation for identifying bodies in advanced stages of decomposition, including working at Darwin Cemetery in the Falklands, where the International Committee of the Red Cross has led an effort to put names to more than 120 anonymous Argentinian soldiers. He also worked to identify victims of the 2004 Madrid train bombings. He also put a face to Manuel Blanco Romasanta, Spain's first recorded serial offender who claimed a curse which turned him into a wolf was the reason he took the lives of 13 people in the 19th century. There has been no public update on the fate of the men suspected of taking Carlos Alberto Vidiera do Orfeo's life. 22-year-old Kyle Klinkscales lived in LaGrange, Georgia in 1976. The sports-obsessed young man was attending Auburn University in Alabama. At the university, he was beginning to search for his place in the world and mapping out what career to pursue. On January 27, 1976, Kyle left his part-time job at a bar in LaGrange and headed out for the roughly 45-minute drive to Auburn University, where he was a sophomore. Kyle never made it to the university. When his parents could not get in contact with him, he was reported missing. Nothing out of the ordinary was found at Kyle's apartment to suggest that he ran away or had moved elsewhere. Investigators believed that something happened at some point on his trip. They just did not know what it could be. The Troop County Sheriff's Office and Kyle's parents intensively searched for him in those initial weeks after he went missing. Lakes were drained. Rewards were promised. Deputies searched woodlands for a single clue. For Kyle's parents, John and Louise Klinkscales, the effort was a passionate, all-consuming quest, mirroring scores of other missing person cases across the country. With loved ones pleading for tips, searchers growing wearier with each unsuccessful venture, and members of an exhausted community looking on, aghast that something so haunting could have happened to one of their own. The determination was the source of admiration for many. Kyle Klinkscales had always liked New Orleans, so his parents bought ads in the city asking for help to find their son. He had loved Hawaii when he visited once on vacation as a boy, so his parents sent letters to every police department in the state. And when tips came in that a person had been found matching his description, strong jaw, shaggy brown hair, thick eyebrows, they drove to the places where those tips originated. Two years after their son's disappearance, the Clink Scales had distributed nearly 5,000 bumper stickers seeking information. They became supporters for families of others who had missing relatives, 
and tried to call attention to cases not as well publicized. The Klink scales were among those invited to the White House in 1985 to meet with President Ronald Reagan about ways to address the issue of missing and exploited children. In their home, the same one where Kyle Klink scales had been raised and that was decorated with pictures of him smiling and wearing a bow tie, his parents' drive to find their son would sometimes give way to fatigue. In an interview in 1978, John Klinkscales expressed unease. Maybe, he said, his son, who did not really like college, had felt like he was a financial burden on his parents. Instead of dropping out or sharing his feelings, he might just have wanted to make it easier on us by disappearing. Every time Louise and John Klinkscales left their home in LaGrange, Georgia to search for him, one of them would leave behind a note. If their son returned while they were gone, they wanted him to know that a lot had changed since he was last seen in 1976. They loved him, the Klinkscales would write, and there on the dining room table was a spare car key for him. Both John and Louise Klinkscales submitted their DNA samples to investigators for testing, in case their son's remains were ever found. Sadly, John Klinkscales passed away in 2007. Louise passed away in January 2021 at the age of 92. A driver in Cusetta, Alabama, about 30 miles southwest of LaGrange, was on a two-lane road on December 7, 2021, when he saw the hatchback of a rusted vehicle sticking out of the creek and called the authorities. It was a 1974 Ford Pinto poking out from the creek. There were human remains inside the rusty car and about 50 skeletal fragments encased in the mud. It was not clear what allowed the car to become visible from the road after all this time. In February 2023, the Georgia Bureau of Investigation confirmed that the remains belonged to Kyle Klinkscales. The creek where the car was found in Chambers County, Alabama, outside of LaGrange, was never searched because the road would not likely have been Kyle's main route to Auburn, though it might have been an alternate one. Erin Hackley the coroner in Troop County, Georgia, said that it might take investigators months to determine the exact cause, if they can pinpoint one at all, given the age of the remains. Ms. Hackley said when she got the call from investigators that the remains had been identified, she called Kyle's aunt, Martha Morrison, who responded with relief and regret that his parents were not alive to hear the news. Martha added, They were very strong Christians. They had faith that things would work out for them, and they never gave up hope. When the remains of Kyle Klinkscales are returned to his relatives, we plan to drive to Shadow Lawn Cemetery in LaGrange. There, in the soft dirt, between the graves of his mother and father, he will be buried, nestled in a space set aside years ago. On March 17, 2015, a hiker walking the Lone Mountain Trail in Carson City noticed a shoe sticking out of the ground and alerted authorities, who found the buried body of a woman wrapped in a sleeping bag. Authorities estimated that the woman had passed away about a year before she was discovered. Investigators followed the usual procedure to identify the woman, but were unable to and she became a Jane Doe. The Carson City Sheriff's Office brought the case to the DNA Doe Project in 2019 to attempt to investigate genetic genealogy to trace the Jane Doe's identity using DNA matches to build her family tree. After a complex series of laboratory processes to extract DNA and translated into a workable profile for a comparison to the millions of records in the databases, 
volunteer investigative genetic genealogists got to work in May 2020. The DNA Doe Project said since research began, more than 13 volunteers have worked to connect the matches with family trees, going back to ancestors born in the mid-1700s in England. It took a little less than a year to narrow the search to a single family in the vast tree. Three of the six siblings were women, and this lead was offered to the investigating officers to follow up. In October 2022, a family member of the Jane Doe's Ancestry DNA test was uploaded to gedmatch.com, a public database that can be used by law enforcement cases. After this DNA match, investigators confirmed that the Jane Doe is Joyce A. Rogers Annis, originally from Michigan. In addition to providing the critical lead to this identification, the DNA Doe Project team also provided information about a man associated with Joyce, who later confessed to burying her body on Lone Mountain. It turned out that 72-year-old Joyce passed away due to natural causes, and her husband, Edward Barton, buried her in the mountain. They were homeless and had no money for a funeral. Unfortunately, there is no way to prove or disprove Edward Barton's version of events, and the case is currently considered solved. A group of kids playing off of Amherst Street in Granby, Massachusetts, found a woman's body on November 15, 1978, buried under a pile of leaves. Investigators were able to determine that she had been fatally shot in the temple. There was also evidence that the woman's body was dragged by a man's belt. It was estimated that her life was taken roughly three months before her body was found in August 1978. Investigators were unfortunately unable to identify the woman, so for decades she became known as Granby Girl and was buried in a local cemetery with a headstone marked Unknown. On March 6, 2023, the Northwest District Attorney's Office held a news conference at the Granby Police Station to announce the major breakthrough in the case. It was announced that the remains found back in 1978 belonged to 28-year-old Patricia Ann Tucker. She was born on July 28, 1950. First Assistant District Attorney Stephen Gagné said advances in DNA technology allowed them to find Patricia's half-sister in Maryland, who led them to her son. He was just five years old when Patricia vanished. Stephen Gagné said, While it is satisfying to finally know who Granby Girl actually was, the investigation will not stop until we identify the person that took her life and bring the family an additional measure of closure and justice. This investigation has spanned decades and will continue until each and every possible lead is explored. Stephen Gagné said Patricia was married to Gerald Coleman, and they were living on the shore of Lake Pocatopog in East Hampton, Connecticut back in 1978. Coleman never reported his wife missing, he passed away in prison in Massachusetts in 1996. According to Stephen Gagné, Coleman is now a person of interest in Patricia's case. Patricia had earlier gone by married names Patricia Heckman, Patricia Dale, and later Patricia Coleman at the time of her disappearance. Anyone with information about the case should call Granby Police at 413 Four six seven nine two two two, or email jwhite at granbypd.org. Patricia's son, Matthew Dale, who is now 50 years old, also spoke and recalled his last memories of his mother. She was in the front seat of a stranger's car wearing a vest. It was 1978. Matthew was in the back seat on Nubby Upholstery. A man he did not know was driving, 
but Matthew vividly recalls the last words his mother ever said to him before she disappeared. She told me to go across the street to the playground, Matthew said, referring to a group home for juveniles. She said goodbye. Now in middle age, Matthew's memories are fuzzy. Best he can recall, the facility was outside Boston. His father collected him the following day and raised him after his mother left him. Matthew has lived in North Carolina most of his life. He grew up dogged by the mystery of his mother's disappearance. Rumors swirled among family members, including speculation that Patricia may have entered the Federal Witness Protection Program. Matthew said that he was in his 30s when he accepted that his mother was no longer alive. My mother fell in with the wrong crowd. She was not a hiker, like some of the stories said. Through the years, I have been told so many lies about it. His father passed away in 2015, and Dale has felt somewhat adrift, although he is happily married, is a father, and has been a union electrician for most of his life. Several weeks before the identification was made, police showed up at his door. They asked him a few questions, explaining they found him through his uncle in a DNA database. They said Granby Girl. I thought, what is Granby Girl, Matthew said. State police investigators did not offer many details, but said they had exhumed Patricia's body. Matthew had filed his DNA in a database in case his mother was ever identified. He sent investigators a file of his digital DNA profile and they contacted him by phone within hours. They said it was a clear genetic match. He has scant keepsakes of his mom, a single photo, baby books she created for him, a lock of his hair and a small tapestry she painted when he was small. Matthew said he plans to arrange for a proper grave for his mother. For years, the grave has been marked only with a wooden cross. In 1998, Granby residents donated money to create a more dignified marker. Matthew said, It was an awful end. What I want to do is have a new gravestone made for her. She deserves to have her name on it. In July 1980, the remains of an unknown man were discovered in a wooden crate in the Chicago Greater Area Sanitary and Shipping Canal. The crate containing the body had been removed using heavy equipment, along with other debris from a grate that prevents objects from flowing into the power plant. The crate broke open sometime during removal and dumping by power plant employees. The body was found by an employee a couple of days later looking for driftwood. Advanced decomposition made identification difficult. Items recovered along with the remains included several vehicle keys. Investigators determined that someone had taken the unknown man's life, as his autopsy revealed that he had been shot in the abdomen with a shotgun and then multiple times with a handgun. Investigators suspected that the man lost his life several days before the discovery of his body. Investigators believed that the unknown white male was between 25 and 35 years old at the time his life was taken. They estimated that he was 5 foot 11 inches tall and weighed approximately 175 pounds. Investigators observed that he had light brown to blonde hair that was approximately two inches in length. At the time of discovery, the man was wearing dark blue work pants that had a laundry mark, Jim 5, a green pullover t-shirt with a pocket, wool socks, and a single dark-colored herringbone house slipper. Partial fingerprints were recovered from the body. They were submitted to both state and federal databases for a comparison, but failed to match anyone. Some dental evidence was developed, but did not match any known missing persons. For over four decades, law enforcement have diligently pursued various leads about the unknown man's identity. In November 2009, 
His case was entered into the National Missing and Unidentified Persons System, and STR testing was performed, but there was no match to anyone. Despite exhaustive efforts from law enforcement, the man's identity has remained a mystery. With few leads for investigators to pursue, the case eventually went cold. In 2022, the Will County Coroner Office, as part of a long-standing collaboration with Othram, decided to leverage forensic genetic genealogy to see if they could establish an identity for the man or a close relative. Will County Coroner's Office has contributed substantial funding towards the testing for this case, and the rest of the needed funding was crowdfunded using DNA Solve's platform. Skeletal evidence was sent to Othram and a suitable DNA extract was developed. Othram scientists used forensic-grade genome sequencing to build a comprehensive DNA profile, and Othram's in-house genetic genealogy research team used the profile to develop investigative leads. The leads were returned to law enforcement and a follow-up investigation, along with confirmation DNA testing of a family member, confirmed that the 1980 victim was Webster Fisher, born September 25, 1950. The Will County Coroner's Office announced on March 22, 2023, that the remains belonged to 29-year-old Webster from Chicago. Sergeant Mike Ernest said, Obviously, there was a lot of mob-related crimes back in that era, and a lot of that came into Will County. So is that a possibility we will explore? Yes, it is something I can say for certain. I do not know. Webster's wife recently told investigators that her husband left home in mid-July 1980 to get cigarettes at a gasoline station about a block away, but never returned. Relatives said Webster was eventually reported missing to the Chicago Police Department. Joe Piper, a deputy coroner and cold case investigator with the Will County Coroner's Office, said, This gentleman is somebody's father, somebody's uncle, somebody's brother, and it is nice to be able to give the family some kind of closure, because they are looking and wondering whatever happened to their loved one. Anyone with information that could aid in this case is encouraged to contact the Will County Coroner's Office by calling 815-727-8455.